boss. Hi, the government is setting up a new IT project worth a lot of money. I want you to do an analysis and tell me how much we should bid for this project. Not too low or we lose money, yet not too high that we lose the bid. Please do this as soon as possible so I can submit the bid. Oh, okay boss. No problem. Postman! Hi, I would like you to deliver this to box. Yes, I am. Yes. If you can give me the documents, I will give you a handsome reward. How about that? Yes, you got a deal. Ah, great. Hi. Hey, yes. I have your message. Oh, so what is it? It's 50. Ah, 50. Okay, great. I shall give you a handsome reward when you come and see. Nice to have your message. Thank you. Regarding the tender for the IT project, my firm would like to place a bid of $50,000. Hello? What? We lost the bid? What was the winning bid? $49,900. By whom? Company A? My ass driver? Let me call my security consultant. We recently lost the bid for the government tender, lost by $100 only. I suspect someone intercepted the information and outbid us in the bid project. Okay, I believe the information was intercepted when your employee passed the document to you. How about a new method of communication between your employees? Let me show you more. Okay, sure. Encryption is the process of converting information into an apparently unreadable state. The driving force behind the development of cryptographic systems and processes was the need to protect information, particularly by governments and militaries. Some notable systems of encryption were the Egyptian method of using a set of non-standard hieroglyphs in place of a normal set, Caesar's shifting substitution cipher, and the German Enigma cipher machine. In general, systems such like these rely on both the sender of the message and the recipient having the same means to encrypt and decrypt messages. That is, a single key is used to convert a message from plain text into an encrypted state and can also be used to convert the encrypted message back into plain text. These keys are the cornerstone of these encryption systems and care must be taken to make sure they do not fall into the wrong hands. This is because anyone who gets the key will be able to read any message that was encrypted with it. During the Second World War, the German Enigma system became compromised as a result of this weakness. It relied on the regular transport of key tables to troops, which could be intercepted by Allied forces. By obtaining these key tables, the Allies were able to easily reverse engineer the Enigma system. One way of addressing the issue of a single point of failure of a common key is the public key cryptography system. In these systems, Two keys are required for an entire encryption-decryption cycle to be performed. One key is used to encrypt messages, while the other is used to decrypt them. In these systems, we call the encryption key the public key, which can be given out to anyone or even freely broadcast. The decryption key is known as the private key, which the recipient will keep secret. Messages are encrypted with the public key and decrypted using the private one. This means that anyone can use the public key to encrypt a message, but such messages will not be able to be decrypted by anyone other than the holders of the private key. One method of implementing public key cryptography is the RSA algorithm, which takes its name from those of its authors, Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Alderman. First published in 1978, RSA soon became widely used for electronic commerce. Some other uses of RSA include software package signing, 
where a digital signature is generated by passing the package with the private key. Users can then use the public key to validate the signature, which could only be generated by someone holding the private key, the trusted source. In secure shell communications, a method of remotely accessing and controlling another computer, RSA can be used as a method of authentication in place of a standard password. The computer that will be used to access others holds the private key, while the remote computers hold the public key. Similar to the previous example, this ensures that only your computer with the private key can gain access. The NUS School of Computing Sunfire server uses this method of authentication. Another use of RSA is as a possible implementation of the Open Pretty Good Privacy standard. This can be seen in GNUPG, a program utilizing said standard. Before we delve into the workings of RSA, we must first go over several terms and assumptions. First, all the numbers we deal with here will be positive integers. We define a prime number as a number that can only be divided by one or itself. The greatest common divisor, or GCD, is the largest number that two numbers can be divided by. Two numbers are said to be relatively prime when their greatest common divisor is 1, that is, the only number that both can be divided by is 1. Modulo is an operation that will give us the remainder of a division operation. For example, 5 modulo 2 will give us 1. This is the remainder of 5 divided by 2. Finally, the totient function of a number gives us the amount of numbers that are both relatively prime to that number and are smaller than it. Let's take a look at how RSA works. This is how we would implement an RSA system. To do so, we'll begin by selecting two prime numbers, let's call them P and Q. We then multiply P and Q to get a number N. P times Q is equal to N. We also obtain another number M, the totient function of N. M is equal to P minus 1 multiplied by Q minus 1. We now need a number E such that E and M are relatively prime. Remember, this means that the greatest common divisor of E and M is equal to 1. E can be any number that meets this requirement, so we could just randomly choose numbers until we find one that's relatively prime to M. Our public key is the pair of numbers N and E, which will be used by others to encrypt messages to us. Now that we have a way to encrypt messages, we need a way to decrypt them. We need to create a private key to decrypt any encrypted messages we receive. The private key consists of N, which we already have, and another number, D. To get D, we find a number K, which satisfies D E equals K M plus 1. We can rewrite this to get D equals K M plus 1 over E. We can do this by trial and error, substituting values of k until d becomes an integer. This can be done through a computer program. So we now have our private key, n and d, which we will keep secret. Now that we have the tools we need to encrypt and decrypt messages, how would we go about doing so? To encrypt a message, we apply a simple transformation using the public key. Let's say s is our message, which we've converted into a number. To encrypt it, we raise it to the power of e and take modulo n of this result. Remember that modulo n is a function that will give the remainder of s to the power of e divided by n. Let's call our encrypted message s prime. To decrypt it, we apply a similar transformation, but this time using the private key. We take s prime to the power of d and take modulo n of the result. This will give us our original message, s. We shall now prove that the RSA algorithm does in fact work. We'll use the same variables as we just used, which are displayed here. Remember that the encrypted message s prime is the result of raising the original message s to the power of e and taking modulo n. To decrypt an encrypted message, we raise it to the power of d and take modulo n. To prove that RSA actually works, we just need to show one simple thing. If we take the original message s, encrypt it to get s prime, and decrypt s prime, we should get s again. 
This makes sense intuitively, the decrypted message is just the original message. Using the variables we have established, this is to say that s is equal to s to the power of e mod n to the power of d mod n. This can be simplified to s to the power of e d mod n. Let's begin. Earlier, we said that the decryption key d was related to the encryption key e by this relation. d is km plus 1 over e. Multiplying by e, we get de equals km plus 1. Since m is the totient function of n, it's given by p minus 1 times q minus 1. We can then say that de is equal to k times p minus 1 times q minus 1 plus 1. Let's take a step back for a moment to introduce some new terminology. Two numbers, let's call them a and b, are said to be congruent modulo c when both of them have the same remainder when divided by c. This is written as shown here. Note that this does not mean that the two numbers a and b are equal. We now have two different conditions we need to look at. The first is the possibility that the prime number p is a factor of our message s. This means that s mod p is equal to 0, and s and 0 are congruent modulo p. This is a highly unlikely situation, but nevertheless one we must consider. The properties of congruence say that if any two numbers are congruent modulo c, the same numbers raised to the same positive integer power will also be congruent modulo c. This is shown here. This means that we can raise both s and 0 to the power of e d, and they will still be congruent modulo p. Another property of congruence is that if a number a and b are congruent modulo c, and b and another number d are congruent modulo c, a and d are also congruent modulo c. Applying this property, we get this result. s to the power of e d and s are congruent modulo p. Let's put that aside for now and focus on the second case, where the prime p is not a factor of s. This is the type of case we're more likely to encounter in the actual application of RSA. Because p is not a factor of s, we can say that s to the power of e d mod p will give us some number, doesn't matter what it is. Because d e is equal to k times p minus 1 times q minus 1 plus 1, we can substitute and get this equation. There are two properties of exponents that will help us in the next few steps, which we'll just leave over here on the right. Using the first property, we can get this. Remember that p is a prime number. We can now introduce Fermat's little theorem, which states that for any prime number b, a to the power of b mod b is equal to a mod b, provided a is not divisible by b. A variant of this theorem is that if a is relatively prime to b, a to the power of b minus 1 mod b is equal to 1. To apply this, we'll use the second property of exponents here to get this. We can then apply Fermat's little theorem to get this. Because 1 to the power of anything is just 1, we can simplify to get the same result as we've just found. So far, we've proven that s to the power of e d and s are congruent modulo p in all cases. So where do we go from here? Since p is a prime number, the same techniques we use to prove this result will also work for q, because q is also a prime number. Thus, we obtain a similar result for q. We will now introduce the Chinese remainder theorem, which says that if a number a and b are congruent modulo some number c, as well as congruent modulo another number d, and if c and d are relatively prime, then a and b are congruent modulo c multiplied by d. We can apply this to our current results, since p and q are relatively prime. Thus, s to the power of e d and s are congruent modulo p q. n is equal to p times q, so s to the power of e d and s are congruent modulo n. Let's rewrite this. Because our message s is smaller than n, s mod n is just s. Thus, s to the power of e d mod n is equal to s, and we've proved our proposition. Though RSA has its strengths, it also has issues just like any other encryption system. As we've just seen in the proof, the message must be smaller than the product of the two primes p and q for the system to work. This is only a problem if small prime numbers were chosen, or if the message is very long. 
The prime numbers chosen must also be sufficiently large to make brute force factorization of the public key difficult. This is increasingly important in today's age of GPU processing, though the problem of brute force attacks applies to any encryption system. Something to note is that because the public key can be made freely available, anyone can obtain it and encrypt messages anonymously. This can be addressed in a novel way. If the sender generates their own pair of public and private keys, they can encrypt a digital signature using their private key. The recipient can then decrypt the signature using the sender's public key. Finally, the system can't protect against someone obtaining the private key and using it to decrypt messages. This should be a non-issue if the recipient takes appropriate precautions. This is very good. We shall adopt this RSC system then. Great. This new package comes with a suite of C programs that will automate the task of RSA key generation, encryption and decryption, so you don't need to worry. It will still show you the steps behind the calculations. The message you sent me last time was compromised. We are adopting this RSA system to encrypt our communications. A new tender is coming up. I'll send you a letter containing the public keys. You will encrypt the message using the programs and send the figure back to me. Even if the postman is untrusted, the information is safe. Okay, no problem. Postman! Coming! Hello. Yes. Hey, I got two new sets of number from company B. Think you might be interested. Ah, very good, very good. What are they? 143 and 17. Huh? 143 and 17? Yeah. Okay, never mind. Thanks anyway. Postman! Hi! Yes! I have one more number! Nice! Which is it? 127! 127! Wow! So high! Okay, thanks anyway! So your message! Okay, thank you! Hi, this is Company B. I'm submitting a bid for this project. I'm placing a bid of $95,000. Hope to receive good news this time. Yes, thank you. Hi, you were right. The information was intercepted alright. But thanks to your RSA system, they never knew what we actually bid. Their bid was $126,000. Thanks for your advice. Let me take a look at uh, <laughs> the C programs that will simu uh, automate that. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah.